So how do you get rid of eye floaters? Well, in this video, we are going to be going over more in depth into eye floaters and how do you treat eye floaters. We're going to go over three eye floaters treatments. So, hey guys, my name is Dr. Joe Allen here. I am the host of Dr. Eye Health, the channel that helps you with the eyes, vision, and finding the best vision products. So thank you for joining me. If you are new here to the channel, please go ahead and subscribe. Make sure that you don't miss any of my other future videos. And again, thank you so much for joining us here. Again, I'm Dr. Joseph Allen. I actually want to give you a little bit of history of who I am and uh, so and where I went to school and all of that. I actually got finished my pre-med bachelor's degree at St. John's University here in Minnesota. After that, I went and got my doctorate of optometry through the Rosenberg School of Optometry in San Antonio, Texas. I graduated magna cum laude and salutatorian. Then I finished my residency in ocular disease and vision rehabilitation and low vision uh, through the v Minneapolis VA Medical Center here again in Minneapolis. Uh, now, so again, floaters is a big topic. I actually practice in a pri in a basic. I practice private. I, I have. How do I say it? I'm in private practice here in Minnesota, um, basically full time, and floaters are something we see pretty much every day. Uh, so I worked this morning and had at least two or three people complaining of floaters. I even had a uh, even had a pediatric patient today who had floaters. And so we'll go over a little bit more into that. Thank you guys so much for joining us in the chat. If you are uh, either watching us here live on through the chat, thank you guys for joining me or catching us on the replay. Uh, this is going to be really fun. So let's go over floaters. Now, if you're watching this and you already have some floaters, guess what? Floaters, eye floaters, is the actual term. Um, we actually have the actual term for floaters, which is just floaters. That's, that's as creative as they got when they came up with this term. So these are the little spots that you see in your vision, and they're kind of like these little black spots, right? Uh, there's these little spots that float around, and if you look from side to side, you sometimes will see it either as a gnat, almost like a bug floating around. Some people actually think that there's a bug in their vision, and they'll try to grasp at it. Or it'll look like a piece of hair, a fiber floating around, or meat, sometimes even as big, big enough, it'll look like a cobweb or something like that. Uh, so, yeah, they can become really annoying for some people. But here's a good question for you guys. Anyone in the chat right now, or if you're catching this on the replay, comment in the section below. How long have you had floaters? Have they been going on for two days, six months, uh, five years, 10 years? Me personally, I've had floaters for almost eight to 10 years. So I first started getting, floater, getting floaters in my early 20s. And honestly, I feel like they're getting worse. Uh, and shout out, you know, shout out to if anybody's having problems, they feel like their floaters are getting worse. So first, let's go over exactly what floaters are, a little bit more in depth. So a floater is first to understand it, there's a gel inside the eye that we call the vitreous humor. Now, that means if you did a cross section of the eye here, the most of the eye's shape is made by the basically the volume of this gel inside the eye. Now, we say it's a gel, however, it is kind of the consistency of uncooked egg whites. If you could imagine that, if you're cooking an egg sometime, uh, if you were to kind of feel that egg white, that's what it feels like when it's uncooked. Uh, now, this gel is actually mostly consistent of water, but 98 to 99% of water uh, is made up that makes up this gel. The other percentages comes up from collagen, specifically type 2 collagen and type 9 collagen, and along with a couple other substances called vitrocin and hyaluronic acid. Now, these different substances, again, they make up most of this gel inside the eye. And I've had a lot of people ask me, yeah, okay, I get kind of, I see these spots, there are little clumps of collagen and water floating around in my eye, but what really causes it? So I, I kind of want to go more in depth on that. That's a good question a lot of people have asked me. So this gel inside the eye, again, it's supposed to take up the shape of the eye. It's mostly there present from birth. And what happens is I do kind of this diagram for you guys. I'm going to share it with you here. Uh, so the gel actually forms and then it actually starts to break down with age. And I know that's kind of a easy, too easy to explain by saying, oh, it's just due to age. Well, there's actually a lot more factors to it. So with, with age, it is true that they get worse as you get older. The earliest report or earliest case of floaters that I was able to find in the literature was in an autopsy study of a four-year-old. So it's sad that a four-year-old passed away, but in autopsy, they found that they had floaters. So even at that young of age, you can have floaters. Uh, these eye floaters 
as we get older, around the age of 16 to 18, almost the early 20s, the eye continues to grow. So around about 20s, uh, actually the gel already starts to transform into a liquid. So by the time you're almost 20 years old, almost 20% of the gel inside your eye has turned into and separated into more of a liquid. Then it just continues to get worse as you get older. So that's why a lot of people who are coming into our to the clinic who are noticing floaters more often are usually in their 50s, 60s, or above. But again, why is this happening as we get older? So there's a couple of different reasons, but a lot of it has to do with cellular turnover. So the gel inside the eye does not turn over very quickly. And so it's basically metabolism. Your metabolism in the gel inside the eye is very, very slow as compared to the rest of the body. And so it doesn't regenerate, basically. There's a couple other factors. The buildup of cellular waste from the retina, from the lens, uh, and the muscles inside the eye kind of contribute to it alongside inflammation. So if you have any sort of a inflammatory event inside the eye, if you've had an iritis, if you've had any sort of trauma to the eye, maybe you've had a uveitis, um, some sort of surgery on the eye that all causes inflammation and that can contribute to it. Then you have actually light, exposure to light, like UV light from sun. If you're not a big sunglasses wearer, or even now there's kind of more theories that perhaps that blue light, because a lot of the blue light that you see, um, and it's a big thing in the media right now, but a lot of the blue light you see is from the sun. And so again, that high energy light passes through your eye and hits this gel, and it could be contributing to the development of these floaters. Now, again, like going to go back to that little slide I had for you guys. So basically this gel, the collagen is in a uniform fashion and then the hyaluronic acid separates along with the water and collagen type nine. That's more of the watery type of collagen. And then all that's kind of left is collagen type two. And collagen type two actually bundles together. You get these bundles of collagen there in part four, the formation of floaters. So type two collagen basically bunches up together and that's what you're seeing. It, it kind of floats in that gel, the liquid that's left and it casts a shadow onto the retina, and you're seeing the out-of-focus shadow of those little floaters drifting back and forth. So that's basically what, what floaters are. Now, it, it's a little bit different for everybody, but I'll kind of show you what I see when it comes down to actual, what I see when I'm looking at stuff. So I notice floaters more on a white background, uh, on the computer screen, and on a blue sky. That's when I notice them the most. And hey, if you're again, if you're in the chat, or if you're catching on the replay, let us know what, when do you see floaters the most? Okay, now this is kind of a diagram of what I see. So when I look at my computer, I see these little spots, but not just the little spots. And this is actually, I don't see the circle object I drew here, but a lot of people do. And if you see a little big round circle in your vision, let me know. So that lens, that big circle that I drew there is significant because a lot of people, especially again as we get older, will notice a large circle in your vision. And that actually is called a Weiss ring. And I'll explain what that is. So the other part of the natural evolution of floaters is the gel inside the eye has an outer layer called the vitreous cortex. And this vitreous cortex is actually in touch with the rest of the eye. It actually touches the aura serrata. It touches the retina, the macula, which you get your central vision from, and then you touches the optic nerve. It actually attaches very tightly to the optic nerve in the back of the eye. And that's what we have circled in the, in the dark circle here. Now that dark circle around the optic nerve, that gel for, touches the optic nerve, and then that gel naturally starts to separate from the back of the eye. It peels away, and it's, it's very tightly adhered to around the optic nerve. Finally, when it fully releases from the back of the eye, it plugs away from the optic nerve, and because the nerve is a circle, you get that little ring. And again, we actually see that in the eye sometimes, and we call that a Weiss ring. So that's kind of what people will see in their vision. And it can be really annoying. So you can sometimes see a circle. Sometimes it'll fold on itself and look like a C. I've had people say, I see like this comma crescent shape in my vision. And yeah, that, that's oftentimes that Weiss ring. And in the clinic, we call that a PVD for posterior vitreous detachment. And it's very common again. Uh, but that's, that's, that's when that gel completely separates from the back of the eye. Now, I just wanted to kind of say hey to everybody in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I see a lot of people talking about floaters and kind of cluster headaches. Uh, thank you, Todd. Um, 
you know, computer usage contributing to floaters? That's kind of a tough question. Again, not nothing I would say that's proven because it's still very new and I don't think they've had any big studies, nothing that I've read. Theoretically, they're having more kind of that idea that, you know, light penetrating into the eye causes more metabolism to kind of have to turn over, especially from sunlight, the blue light you get from sun, very high energy, uh, potentially contributing to that. But uh, again, theoretically, you know, there's a lot of issues with blue light come from computer screens, yes, but it's very low energy compared to how much energy you get from the sun. So maybe, maybe not. And then Joshua here, Joshua Barclay, uh, I hope I said that last name right, but Joshua was just asking, is vitrectomy safe? So that's a very good question. We're going to get in that very soon. Uh, but first, if you guys are catching us here, uh, either in the chat, if you're catching us on the replay, give me a like button. That's going to tell me that you guys actually like this content. It's going to tell YouTube that uh, I should keep making this sort of content uh, and providing this sort of education for you guys. Uh, also, again, someone else mentioned that they noticed like kaleidoscopes or maybe like headaches, things like that. Uh, so there's actually a lot of different causes or different symptoms of floaters, more than just spots floating in your vision. A lot of things can kind of give that uh, sense of spots in your vision. And one of those things can be what's called a migraine with aura, but that's more of like these strobe lights, these lights flashing in your eyes. And I have another video on that, and I'll actually come back and put a link to that here in the YouTube card above, and as well as in the description below for you guys, if you guys haven't seen that or heard anything about that before, I have another video on that. So... Uh, just to kind of, before we kind of transition, I want to answer one other quick question. Uh, Matthew Hall had a question about, isn't the sun yellow light? Actually, the sun is actually gives off a white light. I know a lot of times you know, we always draw the sun as being yellow, but the actual light coming off the sun is white. Uh, but within that white is all different spectrums uh, of light from the electromagnetic spectrum, including high frequency blue light or a very powerful blue light. So let's actually go over the treatments for floaters. Let's go over that. So, you know what, the honest the thing and that get, people get frustrated with seeing their eye doctor because when you go in to see your eye doctor, uh, oftentimes we just, we just watch. We just watch, we say, we observe, we wait for them to get better on their own. And the reason for that is because the rate of improvement for floaters on their own is very, very good. 95% of all floaters will naturally improve on their own within six months. And that happens through a process called neuroadaptation. So once you've recognized the floaters and you give them some time, you've recognized that, hey, these are kind of a normal thing for me, the brain will start getting used to it. And within the first six months, again, 95% of all people will say, I don't even notice the floaters anymore. So that's why doctors in general, they, they don't really recommend procedures or, you know, they wait. They only recommend it for people who have a really uh, more severe issues with them. So that's why we kind of wait. But what if you do? What if you have them? What if you have the floaters and you can't stand it? You, what if you just like you're so frustrated by the floaters? You can't drive. You can't get to work. You can't enjoy your daily living activities. If you're a big reader and you just can't read because that floater's getting right in the way every time, you can't tell, is that a B or an S? I can't tell. You know, like that. if you're having that issue, you got to think there's got to be some solution. What can we do? And doctors have asked that question to themselves. What can we do? So the first thing that's been out for a long time is called a vitrectomy, specifically a pars plana vitrectomy. And that's literally where we remove the gel inside the eye. And so when it's done for floaters, we, there's actually what's called a floater-only vitrectomy, an FOV. That's what you'll see in a lot of literature. Uh, and that's where we, again, suck out the gel from inside the eye in the operating room. And it's it, it actually is a little bit more of involved surgery. It does take a little bit of time. And in school, they basically kind of taught us that, you know, this is an option. However, it's at high risk. There's high risk of all these other complications and problems. And so, you know, despite hearing that in school, over time, and actually just a recent publication in 2017, they reported that 92% of vitrectomies are considered successful. That vitrectomy, 92% of the people who had a floaters only vitrectomy were successful and they were happy with their outcome. And there was very little to no complications or really risk of it at all. And so they also reported, so they also reported a couple of things, because with any surgery, there's always the risk for things like infection and what's called an endophthalmitis, which maybe I'll do another video in the future of what endophthalmitis is, but it's like 
the worst infection you can imagine for the eye. And about only 2% of all uh, floaters only vitrexamines have been reported to have have had an endophthalmitis, so 2%. So really low percentage of chance of having an infection. But then what we learned in school is that you're at a higher risk of having a retinal detachment during that surgery. That's what we taught in school. But again, this most recent publication in 2017, and I'll hook it up in the description below once I'm done posting this video, is that two point, only 2.1% caused a retinal detachment. So that's again, really low risk. So a lot, I think a lot more times people are being more open. A lot of surgeons may be more open to doing a floaters only vitrectomy if you are really bothered by the floaters. But there's a lot more of the things that they kind of want to consider about that. So uh, another kind of good question I just saw here, Juan, uh, can you get floaters if you get shampoo in your eyes? Uh, you know, no. Uh, you may see visual floaters from spots from your vision getting blurry. You could maybe cause yourself a, a, a corneal burn, you know, depending on what kind of in, what kind of whatever's in your shampoo. But no, they should not be a direct link to causing floaters. Uh, not that I'm aware of, anyways. Now the other real treatment. This is kind of the kind of it's kind of a hot topic now in in eye care is something called YAG vitreal lysis. So that uses a YAG laser to basically sh break up or lyse the gel, the vitreous inside the eye. So this is oftentimes kind of compared to having like the asteroids video game. So your surgeon actually will have you sit behind a laser and they'll have you, they'll dilate, dilate your eyes really big so they have a good view of the floaters inside the eye and they can use a little laser and zap perfectly that floater and vaporize it. And over time, they do multi, they can do anywhere from like they can do a couple of hundreds of shots of this laser and just va vaporize this floater completely. Uh, and oftentimes, this procedure takes more than one procedure, it takes a, more than just one visit. Um, but it, it's becoming more popular. It's actually been out for a long time. I actually found out uh, from a couple other resources that this has been going on for like 30 years. They've been doing this for a while. Um, but a lot of doctors didn't do it. It was kind of like a cowboy thing to do if you're kind of gutsy as a surgeon, you want to give this a try without having a lot of big studies. Well, now a lot more studies have come out. And one of the major studies actually came out um, 2017 again. This was from Dr. Singh. And he reported the same 92% success rate. Uh, that depends a little bit on the surgeon, but 92% uh, success with this vitreolysis. And he reported over 1,270-some procedures. And they, with that amount of procedures, they only had a couple of complications. They hit the lens inside the eye twice because they have to shoot through the lens. And if they're too far forward or too far back, you can hit the lens. It's kind of interesting because the power of the laser, it actually... It actually hit the gel inside the eye, and then there's an energy blast forward toward the surgeon. So out of your eye, the energy blast from where the laser hits blasts forward. It's kind of like a plasma jump that comes forward, and that little plasma jump can actually hit the lens and cause some problems. So that's happened twice in that study. Uh, and then seven people had pressure spikes, and only one person had a retinal heme. So they actually were bleeding in the back of the eye. And I've talked to another surgeon uh, that was presenting on this not too long ago, and he said that he's caused like one or two hemes, but they all heal up on their own. So it's really not that big of a concern. So this is becoming more popular because of how safe it is and how quickly it can be done and how easily it can be done. You don't have to go through a major surgery for three, four hours. And it, it, you just sit behind a little slit lamp, a little microscope, and they shoot a laser at you for a couple of times. And so it's, it's excellent. So you may be thinking, hey, this is great. Dr. Helen, where do I sign up? Where do I get this done? And you know, it's, it's kind of tough because not every surgeon's doing it. So you may have to kind of research wherever you're at. If there's a doctor in the area doing gag vitreolysis, uh, you can certainly talk to your primary care eye doctor, uh, whether it's an ophthalmologist or optometrist in your area. Do you know who's doing this? Uh, here in Minnesota, I know of at least two different surgeons who are doing it. And I know another surgeon who's just buying the equipment and he's gonna be start doing it real soon. Um, so if you're thinking about this, let's go through the candidacy. Are you a good candidate for this procedure? So big things for you to think about is one, how stable are your floaters? Again, how long have you had them? Have you had them more than six months? Are they stable? Are they improving or are they getting worse? Uh, you know, so they have to be stable floaters. You have to have no flashes. So flashes of light are sometimes a can occur when that gel again separates from the back of the eye and you get that posterior vitreous detachment, that PVD. The gel can sometimes tug on the retina just a little bit. And if that happens, it potentially may cause a hole, a tear, 
or in a worst case scenario, it can actually pull the retina off completely and we call that a retinal detachment and that's an ocular emergency. And so if you're having those big flashes of light, big spots in your vision, if you're watching this video, stop the video and call your eye doctor right now. We want you to get seen, okay? But flashes, again, if you're considering YAG vitreal lysis, you can't have any flashes. Uh, so no flashes, stable floaters, and in during the during the examination, your doctor will make sure that there's no holes or tears or defects in the far edges of your retina because they don't want to put you at an increased risk because they're going to be putting all this energy inside the eye with the laser and the shock wave from that maybe put you at higher risk of having a retinal tear or detachment. So uh, they don't want that to happen. So again, no untreated peripheral holes or tears. And if they notice a hole or a tear, they may, they'll go ahead and seal it. And perhaps in the future, they'll consider having the vitreolysis later. The other things to consider is a cataract. If you have a very thick cataract or lens opacity, then it's not gonna be the best for you to have that done just because the cataract is in the way and the surgeon's not gonna be able to see through it. And then if they can't see through it, they can't see the floater correctly and so they could miss and they don't wanna do that. So you can't have too much of cataracts and you can't have much for a lens opacity. So if you've already had cataract surgery and you just have an implant, the, the PCIOL, the intraocular implant that they put inside the eye, if you've already had that and it's clear, then you're still a good candidate for the procedure. So keep that in mind too. Otherwise, think about your activities of daily living or what we call ADLs. Are they really affected that much where you need this procedure? So again, you, there's risk of complication with everything. So if these floaters are really bad and you just can't stand it anymore, then yeah, maybe this is a great option for you. Uh, but otherwise, you know, if it's something you're like, eh, you know, I know I'm notice them once in a while, but it doesn't really bother me, then maybe it's not, not the best choice. Uh, otherwise, you know, just to kind of give you, if you're, if you're really thinking about this, is anybody, um, is there anybody watching right now in the chat or catching on the replay that's seriously thinking about having like vitriolysis? Go ahead and comment and let me know uh, because it's it's pretty interesting. So one of the surgeons that I've worked with, what he likes to do is he likes to not only evaluate with the patient, he looks inside, the, dilates the eye, looks inside, make sure he knows exactly where the floaters are. He draws what he sees inside the eye. He draws exactly where the floaters are. And then he asks the patient to do the same thing. And then they compare. They make sure that the floaters that the doctor's seeing is the same floaters that the patient's seeing. And I think that's great because then they know for sure, hey, we're looking at the same thing. We're looking at the main cause. And then they go ahead and talk about doing the procedure. So that's great. So that, that those are really the three medical treatments for floaters. Uh, now, there's a lot of what scares me is that there are a lot of things online I've read and scummed across other YouTube videos, which claim a lot of kind of crazy stuff on how to get rid of your floaters. And uh, yeah, nothing in textbooks of ophthalmology or anything like that. No, I, I've tried to research and find like, oh, is there any sort of any sort of logic behind some of these treatments? And you know, they kind of, they, for me, they scare me and they scare other eye doctors that people are kind of sharing this. And I know people, they kind of have these hopes, but um, a lot of people just don't understand really what floaters are, or what's causing them. So uh, again, thank you guys so much for watching. I have some time for questions here. Let's see if, uh, so I see Sylvia, Ask, is it expensive? So, you know, any sort of surgery on the eye can be a little expensive. It depends where you live and what the surgeon is kind of asking for. If you have insurance, uh, floaters is kind of tough to get insurance to pay for unless it's proven that it's significantly affecting your activities of daily living. Obviously, if it's affecting your ability to work, then yeah, insurance may be able to cover that. I can't guarantee you'll have that, but a lot of, a lot of surgical centers will fight for you to get that coverage because they want you to get back to work, right? You need to make a living. So, the big thing with floaters and the price, again, you know, the price can be all over the place, but I would expect at least maybe, if you're paying cash, expect anywhere from one, at least $1,000 at least in the US. But I, I, I honestly don't know who's paying what, what cash price would be. You'll have to call around in your, in your area. Um, let's see. Looking for other questions. Um, can floaters look like streaks? Yes. Uh, so as the floaters develop, if they're just small little floaters, uh, they could actually have kind of a, 
hair-like appearance. Some people even say they look like parasites. Uh, and they, they can, I guess, if you're really looking at them. But, the, you know, usually parasites can occur in the eye, but extremely rare. And it's usually in, um, like, jungle, uh, tropical areas. Uh, but that is usually, no, you're not going to see it like that. Um, can eye supplements help minimize floaters? Uh, so nothing that is public, like wide scale accepted as supplements for getting rid of floaters. There are some different companies that kind of claim that. Uh, but as far as what I've been able to research, because I was kind of curious myself when I was other side of the people talking about supplements for it, there is, um, some logic about basically, again, the whole met metabolism issue developing within the gel itself, that if you have higher amounts of antioxidants, whether you're ingesting those, uh, using them as an eye drop, uh, that it would potentially help reduce the amount of floaters. But again, once these collagen fibers develop, you basically need to find a way to dissolve the collagen, the type 2 collagen from clumping up. And I think once you've developed the floaters, the any sort of antioxidants or vitamins are probably not going to untangle that. So perhaps they'll help prevent the floaters from developing in the first place. But uh, again, nothing that's proven or widely accepted in ophthalmology. Uh, can you be born with floaters? Sure, uh, I could imagine that. Yeah, um, most of the time, again, age four is the earliest report. So um, some degree of the primary vitreous perhaps can actually develop there even when you're born. Um, but the thing is that when you're born and your vision is developing as an infant, again, you, you're not just born with vision, your vision develops. So you'd actually get used to where the floaters are at and your brain probably would neuroadapt even faster. So you'd probably not even be consciously aware of it till maybe you're much older. Uh, are you, Juan, great question, are you most likely to get floaters if you are nearsighted? Yeah, if you're nearsighted, you're going to have a higher risk of developing floaters. And part of that is because the eye continues to grow, especially through adolescence and into kind of like your late teens, early 20s. So the eye actually grows longer, not a huge amount. It's actually kind of a weird it's like a funny fact that it's not true. Um, I've actually been to like body worlds and things like that when I was a medical student. And they would say like, it would say like, did you know that the eye does not grow after birth? And that's completely wrong. I don't know who wrote that, uh, but the eye does grow. Not very much, but in the eye care world, uh, just one millimeter change in the length of the eye equals about three diopters of a prescription change. And so if you are, let's say, nine diopters myopic, you're nearsighted by nine diopters, that's three millimeters longer. Uh, so that means the gel doesn't grow and change with the eye shape, but the eye does. And so that's three millimeters difference. So that gel is more likely to separate from the back of the eye. And that does accelerate the deformation of those floaters, the vitreous detachment. Uh, another kind of random factoid, uh, when you start developing floaters, you actually have a higher risk of developing a cataract sooner too. Um, can they make you go blind? Well, floaters in general uh, shouldn't make you go blind, but um, the posterior vitreous detachment, if that leads to a retinal detachment, that can potentially cause blindness. And that's one of the biggest concerns that we have is when people start seeing floaters and there's a sudden change, that they don't get into the clinic right away to get it evaluated and they let it go too long and then they have a tear that eventually becomes a full detachment and sometimes you know a lot of times we can repair it that's the great news about modern technology we can repair a lot of detachments but it, it's it's never really perfect so again if you're having those flashes if you're having big spots in your vision like a curtain coming down from the ceiling or rising up from the floor yeah, you definitely want to call the doctor, get seen, just make sure everything's okay. That peace of mind's going to go a long way. Um, young patients about that age. Um, so this is it's great. I, I see um, Dolan, another OD. You know, this is great. They have other doctors here. Uh, he's saying he found what's called an ERM, so an epiretinal membrane. That's what an ERM stands for. Uh, and he said, with associated Weiss ring on a 23-year-old male, 
Uh, and you ask if I found them in young patients about that age. Well, you know, if they have a posterior vitreous attachment, then of course they can have the Weiss ring and you really can have them. Yeah, you can have them pretty young. It's not very common. I mean, usually it's like what we see people in their fifties and beyond usually having it. But yeah, if the person's really nearsighted, maybe they've had trauma, uh, they've been jostled around just the, the fluid dynamics of the gel inside the eye sloshing around can kind of predispose for more of these vitreous detachments. Um, yes, Matt Hall, I do have floaters. Uh, but the, again, back to that kind of thing that uh, Dolan was talking about, the ERM, that epiretinal membrane can actually form due to some changes with the gel inside the eye, again, these vitreous floaters. So as that gel separates from the back of the eye uh, during that posterior vitreous detachment, it's believed that it causes these little micro tears, like really small tears in the retina that we can't really even visually perceive. Uh, and when these little tears form, basically think of it like a scar tissue that scores, that for, kind of forms between the little scratch, the little tear. And then that scar tissue actually bunches up, kind of bunches up like a, it bunches up like a scar. Yeah. And then, we call that an epiretinal membrane, and that eventually can lead to what's called a macular pucker, uh, which can cause some other problems, but that, that can distort vision. So that's something that uh, Dalin was talking about there. Uh, so thank you guys so much for checking out the video. I hope you found some good information. I know we got a lot of good questions coming in. I'm hoping that we'll be able to eventually have more videos and more live streams just like this, including a full Q&A video in the future. Uh, otherwise, I want to get, give a big, you know, good thank you guys so much for kind of help, you know, helping build my channel, being part of this community. I love answering questions. I love being a good resource for you guys. And I'm so happy that people are finding good value in this information that they want to learn about the eyes and vision. Um, and I want to kind of just give you guys a question of the day. It, did you find this video helpful? Did you find this topic helpful? Did you learn something more about the treatments? Is there something more? about the treatments for the eye floaters that we didn't cover. Go ahead and comment in this video. I'd love to hear from you guys. Otherwise, again, this is Dr. Joe Allen here from Dr. Eye Health, a uh, channel that helps you with the eyes, vision, and finding the best vision products. Uh, if you'd like to catch other cool videos, I will have some other videos coming out here. You can click up here to the top to check out new videos, and we'll have some more videos coming up in the future. So go ahead, check those out too. Otherwise, please be sure to subscribe and we'll talk to you soon.